energy comes in four dimensions. So we've got physical energy, mental energy, emotional energy, and spiritual energy. For a lot of us, we exclusively focus on physical energy. Mental energy, which is about your mindset, it's about creativity, it's about your ability to focus. Emotional energy is about your relationship with yourself and relationship with others around you. And then spiritual energy is about meaning and purpose. Adaptability is going to be a very important skill, given how fast the world is changing. If you have the openness to adapt, to try new things, to embrace new technology, you're going to be able to ride that wave. A way that I keep my adaptability high is when I work with mentors, I don't work with one mentor only. One of my mentors is 65 years old. Another mentor of mine is 19. So what can make this journey fun? When you think about your journey ahead, ask yourself two questions. The first is what would this look like if it were fun? Mm -hmm. And then the second question is what would this look like if it were easy. Not all risk takers will be winners, but all winners are risk takers. You've got to take some risk in order to reap the rewards. Approximately 75% of people feel they must make the most out of their creative abilities. They must tap and maximize their creative potential in full. And only 25% of individuals admit that they're actually doing so. Mental and emotional and physical well-being can significantly impact the overall energy available to us humans. When individuals are experiencing high levels of stress, anxiety or depression, it can take a toll in the overall resourceful energy available to us. On this episode, we're talking to Simon Ong, an award-winning life coach and the author of the book Energize that was published in April 2022 and quickly became a bestseller. What are those choices, practices, or maybe secret formulas that are behind sustaining that resourceful level of energy? Let's ask Simon today. Hi Simon, it's great to have you at Portster Studio and thank you very much for, you know, coming in here at a short mm. notice. I know you've got a busy week. Uh, <laughs> so what brought you to Dubai? I love the city. I come to Dubai a couple of times of the year. I come at least once a year with my family and then the remainder is typically because of speaking events, um, business opportunities and, and meetings I have in the city. So what are the business events that you're talking this week? So this week I'm speaking at an event hosted by SHRM right. at the Palazzo Versace Hotel. Yeah. And the topic I'm speaking about is why creative energy matters when it comes to business. Wow. I think this is so relevant because, uh, yeah, uh, let's just tap into that mm. during our conversation. So uh, uh, the creative energy, you, you, you're talking about energy overall <laughs> and your book, that was published, I think, back in April 2022. April 2022 with, uh, with Penguin, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so it's called Energize. Yeah, so it's called Energize, and the essence of the book is about how energy management, not time management, is the key to productivity. What made you actually, at some point of time, talk about energy? So have you mm. always been advocating for energy, or was there <laughs> like a kind of a milestone in your life, or like some, some moment that you know, so brought you to, uh, you know, the overall conversation about energy? Sure. So not always. My previous career was in finance. So when I graduated from university, I went straight into the financial industry at what was the worst possible time. It was the middle of 2007, a year before the financial crisis. And just to make things a little interesting, the company that I started with was Lehman Brothers, okay. <laughs> which, which collapsed into administration 14 months after I joined as a graduate. And so I was in this industry for nearly 10 years, but it was the job after Lehman Brothers collapsed that really opened my eyes to the importance of energy management. So I moved from Lehman Brothers into a hedge fund, mm -hmm. which on paper sounds great, but the reality was anything but. I was sacrificing sleep, I was sacrificing my health, and I was just surviving on junk food. Oh. And there was, this, there was this moment one Christmas where when I finished work, I was going to some client entertainment. And I texted my girlfriend at the time. I said to her, I'm going to come home late. 
I will likely be taking the last train home. So I'll probably be back inside around one o'clock, 1.30. And then I descended into this club. I checked in my bag and my coat. And before I knew it, the entertainment started, the drinks started flowing, and I lost all perception of time. I somehow stumbled into a taxi and I ended up back home around half three in the morning. Mm. I looked at my phone and there was voice notes, there was voice message, there was text from my girlfriend saying, where are you? And she was so worried mm. because I wasn't home at the time I said I was going to be. I tried to escape a potential conversation by going into the bathroom and lying in the bathtub. But she found me there and it was very tough at the time. You know, she was in tears and she looked at me. I was in a very sorry state. And when I sobered up, she wanted me to talk about what was going on. I, I had grown up in, in, in this world believing that I didn't have to share my feelings. You know, my family and society was always saying, as a man, you have to toughen up. You have to work through it and you don't share your emotions. You hide it and you just get on with life. Life happens. But she gave me this opportunity to really open up. And I discovered through this opportunity that vulnerability is the path to connection. And I realized for the first time just how lost I was. I was directionless. I had exhausted my energy physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And it was at that moment that I realized I had to resign. Otherwise, it was going to cost me more than just my physical and mental health. It would cost me my relationship. And so when I resigned, I moved into a job that was far kinder on the hours. Really? Um, still in finance, though, because that was all I knew at the time. Mm -hmm. But it allowed me to reset myself. It gave me the time after work and on weekends to think about what I wanted to do in the long term. It's interesting. How many years overall have you, have you spent in finance? So I spent nearly 10 years and it wasn't until end of 2016, beginning of 2017 that I quit yeah. that industry to then build my own business as yeah. a coach first, then a speaker, an author, and now a consultant and investor. And the transition wasn't easy. I was gonna ask, yeah. was it a tough decision? It was very tough because nobody in my immediate family had ever run a business, let alone a successful business. Yeah. And so for me to go from being an employee to an entrepreneur, it, it, it was a huge jump. Uh, it wasn't as straightforward as quit my job and, and start a business. I had to know first of all what I wanted to get into. And then it was the mental journey mm. of moving from a place where I had security. Every month I knew what I was gonna get paid. I could have some visibility as to the future uh, months ahead and how I could plan for holidays and I could plan around my family. But once I moved outside of that comfort, I was now in a place where I was not guaranteed income every month. I'm not guaranteed opportunities around the corner. Yeah. I've got to go out and make it myself. And that was very different. Now it depended on me. I had control over the future, but it was it was a new experience for me. And, and I had to go out and find mentors and coaches that could help me. Definitely. Uh, so uh, I was going to ask, actually, so since uh, this transition, mm. uh, well, I mean, uh, Probably it has become something uh, <laughs> something popular nowadays. Like people do transform from you know their corporate careers yeah. into uh, you know into their own businesses, and a lot of people are facing that these are tough choices and tough journeys. But why do people do that still? What made mm. you at some point of time back in the days to leave something that was comfort, or you call it a comfort, or was mm. it a comfort? and move to something that uh, was unknown? For me, that moment was when the pain of staying where I was yeah. became greater than the pain of change. Where I was, it, it just didn't make me feel fulfilled. And I think there is a big difference between success and fulfillment. You can look successful on paper. Mm -hmm. Simon has a well-paying job in the financial industry. Most people would love to get a job in the financial industry because of how well it pays. But deep inside of me, I was unfulfilled. I was unfulfilled because I was in an industry that I didn't really enjoy, mm. that didn't really bring out the best in me. Right. And so when that pain of staying there became greater than the pain of change, that was my moment. That was my moment to do something. And looking back, I think it was taking responsibility. I looked at myself and I realized that unless I took responsibility for where I was and where I wanted to be, nothing was going to change. 
nothing was going to change. And I looked at people decades ahead of me yeah. at the companies I worked with. And honestly, I said to myself, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be where they are 20 or 30 years from now. There is so much more out there for me. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to get out there and learn what I need to learn in order to understand the value I can offer the world. And I think that realization is powerful. When you understand that you have something to offer the world and you begin to believe in yourself, anything becomes possible. You know, I often say that there are two sales that occur. The first is selling you to others and the second is selling you to you. Now, unless you can sell you to you, selling you to others becomes a lot harder. It's interesting. How did you sell yourself to yourself? So, meaning, how was your journey to purpose? How, how difficult it was? Did you find it straight away? Did you feel it straight away? I, I didn't find it straight away and I think none of us do. We, we don't wake up one it's, morning. It's and, great to hear that, by yeah. the way. It's, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. And, and you don't wake up one morning and go, I know exactly what I want to do with the rest of my life. That's right. What happens is it begins with curiosity. And so often I ask people, not what is your purpose, because many of us don't know. Mm -hmm. I simply ask, what are you most curious about right now? Because there is wisdom in our curiosities. There's a reason why you're drawn to something, why your gut is saying you should go and explore it. And once we begin to listen to those clues, eventually we discover what our purpose is. Clarity can only come from taking action. If you don't take any action on your curiosities, it's just going to be stuck in your head. You're going to be imagining what could be, but you never really know until you take action. And so I focused my energy on collapsing the gap between idea and execution. So as soon as I had these ideas and insights, I wanted to execute on them because I understood that the faster I could execute on them, the more feedback I would get and the quicker I could progress. How would you find... Uh just to understand, for example, so we can get curious about many things, sure. but can each and everything that interests us become our actually path, become our purpose or become our business, which mm. can sort of sustain our lives as well? So how would you sort of uh, talk about that? Uh, so how how do you choose or select those topics that are really cu we're curious about, mm. but they can become your business? Sure. So first of all, you're right, we can be curious about a lot of things. Absolutely, And yes. the first place to start is to focus on what interests you the most now, yeah. in this moment, yeah. and then to explore it. Now, the beautiful thing about our world is that you can have many different interests, and that's great, because the things that you are interested in makes you unique, mm -hmm. and that's how you can bring that into your business. So, for example, when I was a young boy, I wanted to be an artist when I grew up, but my parents would always say to me, Simon, it doesn't pay. Keep it as a hobby, but don't build a business around it. Don't build a career around art. And so I didn't follow through in making art a career. It, it became a hobby. But when I started running a business, suddenly my creative energy came back. Mm -hmm. So I was expressing my artistic insights through business. So to give an example, when, when we published the book, I wanted to think about how I could create a unique experience for people to engage with it. And so we partnered with the Connaught Hotel, for example, to create an energized cocktail. Nice. So people could buy a cocktail and have it served on a copy of my book. We partnered with, uh, with a metaverse education company where we put on one of the world's first book launches in mm -hmm. the metaverse. So just imagine you're putting on this VR headset and you are engaging with avatars from across the world around my book launch. And then later this year, we are doing a six course dinner in collaboration with a chef with each dish inspired by a message from my book. And this is That's my artistic uh, interest coming out through creativity and through business. So don't dismiss the things that you are interested in. Mm -hmm. They're the things that make you unique. Now, it might not be the thing that you are known for, but it allows you to approach things that other people are also doing in a different way. That's true. That's where you're bringing you to the table. That's where you're making your business, your brand, your message about you authentic. How do you make this part of your brand as well? So, I mean, are you articulating that, uh, you know, these kind of creative ideas are coming to you because yeah. 
actually creativity is part of your identity probably creativity is part of your identity we all think differently you will spot things quicker than other people in different ways and when it comes to authenticity it's really about understanding what is your version of delivering a piece of content to the world mm -hmm. how do you communicate it some of us prefer to write Others prefer to record videos. Yeah. Other people find it easier just to share audio. Other people might want to share it through illustration. All of these things are different vehicles, but they're still communicating a message. And it's to understand what is your best medium to communicate your value to the world. What are your probably advices or the strategies you would recommend to people who are looking for that voice because I know a lot of people would be like yes mm. I am trying to look for my <laughs> voice I want to be authentic what are those strategies that I can apply to find that authenticity sure well simply put the fastest way to find your voice is to use it mm. use your voice we overthink too much and then act later it's far better to act first and then overthink after. Because as soon as you try things and experiment, what happens is you get feedback and then you can iterate, you can refine. But a lot of us delay the action because we focus too much time on planning, brainstorming, ideation, and we, we don't actually put things into action. And by the time we put into action, the people that were watching around us, our competitors, they're already moving ahead of us because they're making action the first step. Just like scientists, when a scientist approaches an experiment, they test first, record the feedback, test again, phase two, re record the feedback again, and then do next phase, next phase, and they're constantly experimenting and testing. That's the same approach we have to take if we want to discover our voice. What are the things you are interested in? How can you test them? How can you try them? Reflect on your, your feedback from it, and then refine, try something else, try something else. Treat the whole thing as a game or experiment because then it becomes fun. And when it's fun, you're going to show up with a lot more energy. Oh, totally. <laughs> I think fun is actually a source of a really resourceful energy mm. for sure. I was going to ask you, um, what uh, differentiates people who take action from people who don't? In other words, what prevents people from taking an action? In many cases, what stops people taking action is fear and doubt. It's fear of the unknown. But the fact is everything is unknown unless you try. And doubt, because we doubt ourselves, We doubt our capabilities. We doubt our potential. Why do we doubt ourselves? We doubt ourselves because we have no reference point. If you've never done something before, there's nothing to reference to. You don't know if it's going to succeed or not. And so we approach a task with this idea of success or failure. If it succeeds, I know I've done a good job. If it fails, maybe I shouldn't have done it in the first place. But that's a big mistake. What we want to actually do is remind ourselves that failure is part of success. You, you can't achieve any level of success without failing in something. A simple way to put this is that not all risk takers will be winners, but all winners are risk takers. You've That's got to take some risk in order to reap the rewards. So when we think about fear and doubt, the first thing to understand is you will never eliminate fear. Fear is part of being human. Fear is a construct uh, that protects us. Yeah. All you can do is create a healthier relationship with fear. And nothing beats fear more than practice. So if you've never done something before, what you want to do is chunk it down to the minimum action that you can take that just nudges you a little bit out of your comfort zone. So you want to stretch yourself, but you don't want to stretch yourself too much that you go into the panic zone mm. and you retreat very quickly back into your comfort zone, never wanting to leave again. You want to stretch yourself a little bit each day because once you stretch yourself, what happens is you begin to fill up your confidence bank. Your brain says, that wasn't so bad actually. Maybe we'll try pushing ourselves a little harder next time. And so what happens is the courage to take action results in confidence. On the doubt side, the reason we doubt ourselves, as I said, is because we have no reference point. And this is why having courage is so important. When you have courage to do something you've not done before, suddenly that doubt starts to melt away. Also, what feeds that doubt is when you have an environment around you where people say you can't do it, 
where people put you down, where they drain your energy, that just feeds into your doubt. So in order to help manage that, you want to have an environment around you that makes it impossible not to succeed. I think there's a lot of competition between humans generally. Overall, that's how we sort of develop mm. and that's how we naturally build relationship <laughs> with each other. And uh, that competition overall in the society probably puts us in a situation uh, where we start, you know, probably doubting ourselves or mm. getting into that fear, but we're still sort of we're referencing ourselves towards some social norms, mm. let's say. And they are defined by the level of competition uh, yeah. we have in the society. I mean, it's a little bit complicated, but I, what I'm trying to say is just, is it really realistic to put yourself in an environment where you'll be surrounded by people who only support you? It's tough because as you say, not everyone will support you. You could be in a great environment. The majority will support you, but there'll always be a few that might be jealous and envious of, of your success. This is reality. I mean, reality is we all have emotions. True. And so that means we're impacted in different ways. There's no one reality. There is only customized realities. So when you win, some of your friends might say, amazing work, great for you, let's go celebrate. And other friends might say that on the outside, but inside, they're really envious about what you've achieved. And they don't want to see you succeed. But you don't know this. And this is why when we think about competition, if you want to have a healthy relationship with competition, only focus on being better than who you were yesterday. That's the only competition you should focus on. Are you better than who you were yesterday? Because if you are, in time you're going to reap the rewards. You are going to enjoy focusing on the process and tweaking and refining yourself to evolve into being a better human. The philosopher Alan de Botton said it, wonderfully when he said that if you are not embarrassed by who you were one year ago you are not growing enough <laughs> because if you are growing enough when you look back one year yeah. at some of the videos you put out or some of the content you put out you might feel a little embarrassed you might say to yourself how man how did i put that out <laughs> why did that look so bad because you're developing you're evolving and so if you evolve and develop you're going to look back and you'll be so unrecognizable to who you were a year ago or a few years back. That's true. And uh, no, I uh, I absolutely, you know, accept and, you know, uh, I love the message about competing only with yeah. yourself versus, you know, competing uh, with, uh, you know, somebody who's in the same, let's say, industry or whatsoever. Mm. But uh, what kind of work, let's say, individuals need to start doing probably on a daily basis to practice this, mm -hmm. you know, uh, self-referencing rather than, you know, society referencing, getting away from society standards? Well, I think, first of all, first step is focus on competing with your, yourself. How can you be better than who you were yesterday? The second is if you're going to look uh, other reference points, don't look at your competition. That's what everyone is doing. That's Instead, true. look beyond your competition. Now, when I talk about creative energy, creative energy is born from your ability to think different. Now, if you are only looking at your competition, how are you going to think different? You're not. You're going to fall into groupthink. So the way you differentiate yourself is you look beyond your competition and into other industries. So you go into one industry and you say, well, what's working here that I can bring into mine? And here's what happens. When you look beyond your competition and you bring in an idea that's worked in a very different industry or field, you look like an innovator. You look uh, like an original thinker. So for example, Steve Jobs, during one of the trips he made to Japan, he saw that a Japanese electrical appliance company that made rice cookers, they had this magnetic cord mm -hmm. on the back of their products. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to understand why that was. And he found out that the reason was because if a child was to trip on the wire that connected the device to the switch, the cable would come out, mm -hmm. but the device would stay still. So it wouldn't fall on top of the child's head. And Steve Jobs looked at that and he said, this is a genius idea. I'm going to bring that magnetic cord into the next MacBook product. And when he released it, everyone in the industry called him a genius. They said, what a novel idea. What a fantastic solution. 
yet he took that idea from a different industry. So if we're going to look at anybody else for a reference point, look at people outside of your industry and then look at what's working. How can you bring that into your industry so you act different to your competition? But why do then companies and people get into that trap of only comparing themselves with, uh, you know, their people in their niches? Why there's so little innovation of this kind that you've just described mm. happening across? The, is it hard? Well, it, it requires work. You know, it's so easy to look at your immediate competition and be lazy about coming up with ideas. You know, when you bring a group of managers together and you say, what ideas do you have on how we can innovate and be different to the competition? The first thing we do is we look at who are the top players in our own industry and what are they doing that we're not? So immediately we're defaulting to looking at our own competition in the industry. I mean, yes, you can look at them and see what they're doing successfully, mm -hmm. but really, do you want to follow exactly what they're doing? Because your company will just become a me too. It would just be a, a copy of that company. Instead, look at what they're doing well, but also look at what they're not doing so well and how you can differentiate yourself. That in itself requires work because you've got to go out there and try and understand how to do things differently. And to do that means you've got to look outside of your industry. You've got to collaborate. You've got to bring in more opinions, involve more of the people in your organization in those discussions. I think it also probably uh, gets into will my idea be liked is mm. this really a smart idea or maybe it's uh well, it's, it's and, not and, and a, this is why this we, idea is not as smart right and this is why we have to prioritize action over overthinking you know mm -hmm. there was this famous psychological study uh done by peter skillman a designer mm -hmm. so he set out to get groups of four people so each group had four people and their challenge in 18 minutes was to build the tallest tower Mm -hmm. Now, all they had uh, for resources was 20 pieces of dried spaghetti, a marshmallow, some tape, and some string. And together in the team of four, they had to build the tallest tower in 18 minutes. Yeah. Of the different groups of people they had, they had kindergarten children, they had MBA business students, mm -hmm. and they had CEOs. Do you know which group won? Of course, the kids, I the think. The kids won, yeah. Because <laughs> they don't have limitations. And, uh, and then it was the CEOs and then it was the business students. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason is because with the MBA students and the CEOs, their first step was to brainstorm and then to play the status game, mm -hmm. which is, well, how do I position myself relative to other people in this group? Who knows more than me? Is it safe to share my ideas? And then is they're planning. Is it safe planning. to share my ideas? Indeed and then planning. And then by the time they take action on the plan and on the ideas, there's only a few minutes left of the time. Whereas the children, they're not playing status games. They're not worried who CEO of Spaghetti Inc. They're focused on action. So they get their hands dirty. They get straight into action. And then from, from that action, they get an insight. They get an idea. And then they collaborate. And they try again and again and again. So by the time it gets closer to the end of that time, they've already understood how to play the game. Yeah. But what do you think uh, the companies, let's say, since we're talking uh, mostly for the B2B audience, mm. what do companies, what would you recommend uh, to the companies to reinvent in their cultures so that they mm. could get this, you know, uh, creative energy back or maybe get this born yeah. actually in the in, in the environment so what do you simply, think has to be reinvented simply put you get what you incentivize for so if you are not incentivizing for creativity you're not going to get creativity so you need to incentivize for creativity so what this means is that first you want to encourage an environment where creativity is championed and then you want to reward it you want to reward it by acknowledging and recognizing the people who have put forward innovative ideas, who are testing things, who are putting things into action. Because when you reward a behavior that you would like everyone to model, everyone follows suit. But if you don't reward that behavior, mm -hmm. they follow the behavior you're rewarding. So I remember consulting for a law company in the UK. Yeah. And they told me the culture that they wanted to create because their culture had got very competitive. Uh, it, it was very toxic. And I asked them, tell me your remuneration structure. And they said, the way we remunerate our partners is they get paid a base salary and they get paid a bonus 
depending on how much new work they are responsible for bringing in and how much they accomplish in a given year in terms of the deals done. Now, if you look at that structure, it is not incentivizing the partners to train up the new joiners. It is not incentivizing them to share the work with other people. Mm -hmm. It's it's, it's incentivizing them to do the opposite. Because if you're getting paid a bonus depending on how much business you bring in, you don't want to involve other people. You want to be the one focusing on the selling. If you're incentivized by the number of deals you're getting through the pipeline, again, why do you want to give up time to coach the younger employees? You're not incentivized. So what happened is when they changed that, when they said, okay, we're going to reduce that impact by 50%. So 50% of your bonus is determined by what you know from the previous years. But the other 50% is now going to be determined by how much time you spend coaching the younger employees and going out to represent our brand. Suddenly, their behavior changed. So you get what you incentivize for when it comes to company culture change. Uh, Absolutely. So why do you think uh, now it has become so important, so critical, so significant for brands, for companies, for individuals to tap into their creative potential and to bring that creative potential back? Why do you Mm. think now? So is it something that is it too much competition? Is it too toxic? Do we need to transform as a society? I I think if we look at a broad level, the reason is because our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So what this means is that with shorter attention spans, how do we engage with our prospects? How do we engage with our customers? We need to be able to get their attention. And this is why creative thinking is so important. How do you come up with ways to get their attention say, hey, you should have a discussion with us. You should look at our products or service because we could really help you. But if their attention span is short, you've got to approach it in a different way. Mm -hmm. You've got to approach it in a way that gets their attention by understanding what is important to them. Because in today's world, we get so many inquiries. There is so much uh, competition in any industry that you look at. There are so many people opening businesses every day. And so for you to stand out, you've got to be constantly evolving. You've got to keep asking yourself, how can I act different? How can I think different? How do I create an experience where that becomes the premium? The products, if you look at it, are mostly the same if you look at any industry. But what differentiates a product is the experience that you receive, the experience that you go through. So if you go to a a general supermarket, you might pick up a, a black tray for, I don't know, $50, $50, for example. If you go to a high-end department store, you might be paying $500 for exactly the same product. The difference is the experience. The difference is the perception that you have about that brand. Yeah, definitely. And the relationship that yeah. this brand is building with you through different things. Uh, it, it's through the experience, it's through the stories, uh, and all of this is driven by creativity. Yes, that's right, that's right. Uh, but. And I also think the impact of the technology also. Mm. Uh, I mean, I feel like we have become a different world over a very short period of time. I mean, we were working pretty traditionally even from, you know, documentation, automation perspective. And then suddenly everything became AI. (laughs) Everything became immersive. Mm. Everything became a virtual reality. And it's only increasing, right? And very soon, these experiences will transform most of yeah. the processes uh, that we're engaged in mm. on a daily basis. So, and I think that particular part actually made brands think differently yeah. about, you know, the, the way they're built and the way mm. they operate. This is why adaptability is going to be a very important skill given how fast the world is changing. If you have the openness to adapt, to try new things, to embrace new technology, you're going to be able to ride that wave. Mm -hmm. But if not, you're gonna be stuck and left behind because the world is moving fast. As you say, if you just look at how quickly AI technology has evolved in the last couple of years, it's crazy. I, I mean, to give an example, my team and I have been putting together content. I don't speak any other language, by the way, apart from English, Mm -hmm. but we've been putting together content where using AI, I can now speak to you in my voice in 12 different languages. Have you already used that? I've already used that, yeah. So That's cool. So when somebody engages with the content and they choose a language, 
they can receive the same content in my voice, but in a different language, as if I'm speaking fluently. Yeah. And that's how quick the world is moving when it comes to technology. You know, all of this is available to us now. So it's not about seeing AI as competition, it's seeing it as another team member. How can you collaborate with AI uh, in order to make what you do more efficient and to reach more people? Because with these developments, I think it's going to divide the world. It's going to divide the world into two camps. On one side, you're going to have hyper consumers. And on the other, you're going to have hyper creators. So what I mean by this is hyper consumers mean there's going to be so much pushed out to the world at record time that there's just so much to consume. There's so much content to consume. Just think about the number of social media platforms, yeah. streaming platforms out yeah. there. There is so much to consume. Now, if you're a consumer, you're great for the creators, but you're not going to make the progress you want in life. Mm -hmm. If you are hyper creator because you're leveraging these technologies, your brand and reach is going to become a lot bigger. How to then develop that level of adaptability? Uh and what's adaptability? I mean, I mean, adaptability in simple words is like how quick you can change to adopt things. Yeah. So how do you develop that so that you as a brand or as an individual, mm. as a business could, you know, transform yourself quickly for the next level of society? Because mm. as you fairly mentioned, we only started talking about AI and now AI is everything. Yeah, I, I think simply put, it is to foster a learning mindset to not be stuck in old ways, to realize that what got you to where you are today is not what is going to get you to where you want to be. That may have worked yesterday, but tomorrow the world is going to be in a very different place. So if you want to adapt, you have to feed that creative energy. You have to create an environment where you allow people to come forward and say, hey, I saw this work in this industry. What do we think about adapting this to what we do? You want to listen to those beneath you because you won't have all the answers. When you're at the top of an organization, you're not going to have all the answers because you can't see everything. So you want to maximize the potential that you have innovative ideas coming onto your table. And the way you do that is by empowering all your members in your organization. Give them the safe space to share new ideas, to go out and explore their curiosities, to try things, get things wrong, and then learn from that feedback. Because if you're fostering a culture which creates fear, where I'm scared to share an idea because it might not work, then you are stopping creativity. You are limiting creativity. But if you're creating a culture where people feel comfortable to share their ideas, even though they may sound crazy, I mean, every idea always begins out quite crazy when it's new. But if you're allowing them to present them, give a good case for it, and to at least try it in some small way, that's what's going to give you more flexibility to adapt when this world changes again and again. So I was going to ask, how do you practice, uh, you know, adaptability kind of development mm. or adaptability culture with probably yourself and the team that works with you? Mm. Is it like a little practice that might, you might actually share? So sure. probably some, somebody can see it as a specific example and try mm. it in their offices or in their environment. So, so to give you one example, a way that I keep my adaptability higher is when I work with mentors, I don't work with one mentor only. Mm -hmm. So one of my mentors is 65 years old. Mm -hmm. Another mentor of mine is 19. Wow. Now they're gonna see the world in very different ways. And what I learned from the 65 year old mentor will be very different to what I learned from the 19 year old mentor. But what that gives me insight into is how each generation thinks. It helps me understand what's important to each one. And that feeds my creativity that helps me to see the world through new lenses. And so if you're looking at a company, one thing you can do is to reverse mentor. So usually when you work in a company, mentorship typically happens mm -hmm. when you have an older, more experienced person in the company sitting next to someone who's younger to show them the ropes, to tell them how the company operates and what they can do to move up the career ladder. Mm -hmm. But how about switching it the other way as well? How about getting some of the younger, less experienced employees to mentor you as well? Because when you've been at a company for a number of years, you can easily get stuck in old ways. And to have young, fresh energy into your mindset can open your imagination to other possibilities. What would be some of the questions that you would ask a younger generation mentor, if I may ask? Sure, so some questions might be, what is important to you when you engage with content on social media? 
True. That would be one question. What is the main platform for you to consume your information on and why would be another question. And another is what gets your attention when it comes to new products and services and what companies or brands do you feel like are ticking the boxes on, on those criteria? Because that helps me understand their thinking. If I can understand the thinking of a 19 year old and learn from lessons from a 65 year old, I can start to join the dots. I, I can start to see patterns. I can start to see insights that I can leverage in, in what I do. And then I can go out into the market and test them. No, that's uh, absolutely a brilliant idea, I think, mm. uh, combining mentors of different ages and mm. obviously having uh, different conversations or yeah. different types of questions uh, um, with different mentors as well. So it's, uh, I think it's a brilliant piece of advice and uh, a great practice to uh, to share. Mm. Um, so one of the... Uh, uh, questions that I had in my actually mind uh, I was listening mm -hmm. to you one of the things that you recorded on YouTube and it, your video is called uh, seven things mm -hmm. I wish I knew earlier yeah. and one of them actually impressed me so much uh, so obstacle is not a block mm. or um, is not a block on your path it is your path mm. so can you tell a little bit more about uh, how, how to take obstacles, problems, or challenges, yeah. not just as part of your journey, but actually as your journey. Yeah, so the first thing you have to accept is that it is inevitable that you are going to have setbacks, failures, and challenges. That is part of the journey of going into the unknown. You're gonna face them at some point. And so when you look back at your life so far, you will have had some challenges and some obstacles. It may be personal challenges or it could be professional obstacles, but you will have had some. At the time, they will have been painful. You may very, not have, very painful, right? Usually, right? You, you, you yeah. may not see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. And in that moment, you feel like your world is crumbling around you, just, just like I felt like during the financial crisis. But when you fast forward to today, what you realize is that those challenges, while painful at the time, shaped you into who you are today. And actually, the greatest lessons, insights, and wisdom come from those events. Those events that we tend to fear, the setbacks, the failures, the obstacles, those very things equip us with the wisdom to come back stronger. If we didn't have them, we wouldn't have that knowledge on how to be resilient and how to bounce back when life throws curveballs our way. So that's why they are the path. They are the path to shaping you into the person you need to be to achieve all those goals you have in life. Is it possible to make the right choices and to get still to the, like, for example, if um, um, your mindset is like, you, you know exactly who you want to be, let's say, in, yeah. in a year or two. I mean, previously we were thinking, who do you want to be in five years? We don't take, we don't talk about that nowadays. But I mean, if you if you know exactly who you want to be in five years, is it possible to actually make that journey with the right choices instead of with the setbacks? And uh, so, is it a balance of setbacks and successes, though? I would say uh, now differentiate the two. So, once you have an idea of who you want to become, you then have clarity on your future self. And for me, this is important because a lot of us, we make present moment decisions based on our past self. So we use our past as a way of making a decision in the present. However, if we start to operate from our future self, so think forward, who do I want to be, say five, 10, 15 years from now, and really connect yourself to that person, that future you, what is he or she doing in that moment? What are they spending their time up to? Who are they spending time with? What accomplishments have they made in their life? And then come back to this present moment from that future you mm -hmm. and make decisions now as if you're already that person. And then your habits and choices are already made. Yeah, You know exactly what your choice is. Now, this isn't to say if it's right or wrong because none of us know ahead of time if a choice is right or wrong. Yeah, But we are making much better decisions by operating from my future self. Our decisions are a lot healthier and yeah. our decisions are much more aligned to who we want to be. Yeah. 
The reason a lot of us are indecisive, we're interested in things, but we're not committed to something, is because we don't really know who we want to be. If, yeah. you, if you did, your choice is made for you. So to give you a very basic example, if my future me was somebody that was athletic and somebody that was healthy and led a very uh, energizing daily routine, then when I go to the supermarket for my shopping, I'm not going to move my trolley into the junk food aisle or the sweet counter. I'm going to move it into the aisle which has fresh fruit and vegetables and things that are good for my body. That decision is made already. I don't need to think about it. And so this is why it's so important to understand who is that person you want to become. Begin with that end in mind. I absolutely agree with you, but I think also there's one more thing that we didn't mm. add to that, and it's the uh, uh, probably the consistency or yeah. you know the effort that you're taking to actually you know stay true to your decision, right? Mm. Because consistency is important. Uh, you know, Denzel Washington said it the best, I think, when he received an award for his uh, performance in the film Fences. When he picked up the award, he said to the audience, without commitment, you will never begin. Without consistency, you will never finish. Easy to begin, harder to finish. And that's what's the, this is the difference between those who are successful and those who are not. Can you be consistent enough at the habits that you know are good for you? the habits that will stack the odds in your favor that you will win at some point. You won't know when that point will be, but you will win at some point down the line. A lot of us, however, give up far too soon. Absolutely. Because we don't see the results, we don't see the outcomes, we give up far too soon. Yeah. So if you can enjoy the process, if you can make the journey fun and exciting, the rewards will come in their own time. So what can make this journey fun? Because I think it's quite difficult to match at the level of, you know, entertainment mm. that you might be as a human being, you know, willing for at some yeah. point of time. And there could be the reasons and maybe like how to keep, you know, yourself entertained with yeah. normal things. I think, And I think that's the sustainable yeah. usage of energy, w isn't it? When you, when you think about your journey ahead, ask yourself two questions. The first is what would this look like if it were fun? Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, what would this look like if it were easy? And your answers to those questions will help you approach that process in a very different way. So for example, uh, I was doing networking, a lot of networking at the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey. I didn't really like introducing myself again and again and again. And so I asked myself, what would this look like if it were more fun? So for me, the fun version was maximizing the people that knew what I did in a quick time frame. Yeah. So I said, the way for me to do this and make it more fun is to not just go to an event and network, but to be the speaker mm -hmm. on stage. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm the speaker on stage, everyone in that room will know who I am by the end of the evening. But if I'm going around networking one person to one person to one person, there's only so many people I can get to know through having these conversations. So that for me became a fun approach mm -hmm. to, to networking. I could maximize the people that would know about me and my work by simply saying, hey, I'll speak at your event for free in exchange for taking some content and a testimonial. Yeah. But for me, it was a great way to suddenly access big audiences because immediately they would understand what I did and they would go onto social media and find my work. So that was a way I could make it fun. Mm -hmm. Another way, when I look at the second question, what would that look like if it were easy? Now, easy will be subjective for each of us. But for me, it could just be doing exercise at home if I've got a busy day. Well, how can I make that easy? Well, I could subscribe to, to an app that would show me how to do a workout. I've outsourced that to someone to just show me. And so I'm able to do that. Even if it's only 10 or 15 minutes, I've still done it. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea of consistency is you don't have to go intense every day. The thing is, if you go intense every day, you might burn out. And you might give up. That's why people that make resolutions give up within the first couple of months. They go hard and strong in January and maybe early February. And then they give up and go back to that former routine. But if you can have consistency. And what I mean by this is some days you, you might do a habit for an hour. Some days you might do it for 15 minutes. But the fact is you are consistent. Mm -hmm. And consistency always outlasts and beats intensity. That's true. 
That's true. It's the way I think also to keep yourself consistent mm. in terms of the uh, habits and yeah. choices, and also not probably blaming yourself too much mm. for, uh, you know, because uh, I tend, to, for example, avoid fun because yeah. I think fun <laughs> is uh, uh, is easier. It's like it's it's an entertainment kind of thing. Mm. I tend to be more strict and serious because yeah. I think that's work. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is not and i think that's uh, yeah but that's i think yeah if, if you can make it fun it's one it's enjoyable but two you're not attached to the outcome mm -hmm. and that's what makes it fun because a lot of us are attached to outcomes mm -hmm. and so we are giving up our emotional well-being in the present to something that may or may not happen in the future mm -hmm. so when i hit this then i'm going to feel happier or when this happens then i can do something yeah but then my question is what does that make you now does that make you anxious, depressed, living for something that may or may not happen? And that's why many end up living this tragic scenario mm -hmm. of living as if they are never going to die and then die having never really lived. Mm. So you want to detach yourself from the outcome. If it happens, great. If it doesn't, I'm still fine. But just focus on enjoying that process. So for me, uh, I shared with you before we aired, uh, I, I've been exploring YouTube. So for me, it's how could I make this process fun and enjoyable? Mm -hmm. and see it like a game yeah. so i'll shoot a video i'll put it out there and then if it does well great if it doesn't i'm fine as well i just look at the learning and then i go okay what's my next video going to be about and then i learn from the last video and tweak it for the next one and so because i'm learning from the tweaks and from the edits and the feedback and reflections that's what's helping me enjoy the process because i'm so looking forward to that next video really i'm like i can't wait to try those new ideas out and i'll shoot the next one and then i'll be like oh i've learned this now and i shoot the next one and it'll be even better mm. so when you focus on just bettering yourself through each iteration you can see the progress now your first video looks so different to your latest video because you of what you've pretty, learned along the way yeah that's true and you grew uh, uh pretty quickly right on youtube yeah but because you have to be in any endeavor you go into if you're going to do it, you want to give it your best shot. And so for me, it's not just put out content, put out content, but how can I approach it in a strategic way? How can I learn from what's working? And, and this is what I call reverse engineering. You want to go out to the market and see who's already doing well in what I'm doing and what is it that helped them do well. So you want to understand the mechanics. And so what I did is I just broke down what are the things that people are doing well and said, well, how can I incorporate those teachings into what I do? Now, over time, I will find my own way of, of being successful on the platform. But for now, I'm learning from what's working. And then I'll test it. I'll test in the first video, and then I'll evaluate the success against those metrics. I did this. Did it work? Yes, no. I did that. Did it work? Yes, no. And then what can I take forward to the next one? It's interesting. So how big is your audience on YouTube now? So now we're approaching 20,000 subscribers. Uh, so we've gone from zero to 20,000 in about four months. That's very, very impressive. <laughs> do, you, do you have any secret formula behind that? Or? I would say if you are putting out YouTube videos, and I think this probably applies to other platforms as well, yeah. is you want to focus on three things uh, primarily. So three things by far should dominate your attention. The first is the title, mm -hmm. the title of the video. The second is the visual thumbnail. What is on the thumbnail and does it connect to the title? And then the third is the first 30 to 40 seconds of the video. Does it connect with the person watching it? Mm -hmm. So within that first 30 to 40 seconds, are you talking to them and making them feel like what you're about to share is going to have a positive impact on them? Or is it about you? So you want to always make the focus on the viewer and how this video or this piece of content is really going to transform their life in some way. Do you think your public speaking journey uh, helped you to understand who your potential audience might be? Yeah, I think because when you do a lot of public speaking, uh, you get feedback very quickly. Yeah. Uh, so when you go into stage and speak and you come down and you answer questions, your feedback is from people talking to you after. So they'll say, I really resonated with this. or I really resonated with that. I really enjoyed what you said here. I love this story. So all of that feedback helps me to understand what is landing. Without that feedback, I wouldn't know. I would have yeah. to guess based on my own evaluation. Yeah. But all of that feedback is fantastic uh, because it helps me to refine for the next one. Oh, they, they really like that story. I'm going to maybe use that story again and maybe go a bit deeper. They liked the way I finished. Maybe I'll learn from that and I'll do that stronger in the next one. And so feedback is so important in order to improve without it. I mean, how do you know if you're doing well or not? So 
how big is your audience overall now? If you, if you, and yeah, yeah. How big yeah, is your so audience? Yeah, so I would say probably about coming out seventy to eighty thousand uh, across platforms. So we, we we should be around a hundred thousand across all platforms in the next next few months. Do you prioritize any of the platforms, and and why? So I would say the three I prioritize the most are YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram for different reasons. Uh, LinkedIn is great for for being in the professional services industry mm -hmm. because everyone who's working uh, in events, at companies, uh, organizations are on LinkedIn. That is the equivalent of Facebook. Uh, and so I've got a lot of business through LinkedIn where people have seen my work and they've booked me to speak at their event or yeah. their conference. So for me, that's a very important platform. Instagram for me is more about branding. It, it's more the customer facing platform. Mm -hmm. It's a shop window, if you will. It's where mm -hmm. people who are interested in who I am will go onto Instagram and they'll look at my videos, they'll look at my content, they might engage, uh, but it's really a shop window for, for what I can offer. And then YouTube for me is where you can build high levels of trust with your audience. Because when it comes to business, people will spend their time with you first before they spend with their wallets. And on YouTube, when it involves long form content, they're going to spend a lot of time with you. On Reels or TikTok, they might spend 30 seconds to yeah. a minute. Yeah. But on YouTube, they could be watching a 10, 15 or 20 minute video. And you watch a couple of those videos, that's hours spent getting to know who you are and your knowledge. Absolutely. And as you build that level of trust, they would then want to learn more about your work, how they can engage with you, partner with you or collaborate. What is some content that you consume yourself as um, as an individual for entertainment or may maybe for work as well? I think it's, it's as simple as looking into the phone and recording your thoughts. Uh, but again, focusing on value. What is the value that you can bring to the audience? Uh, one of the things I found powerful when it comes to podcasting like this or shooting short form content is it forces you to think in a concise way. It forces you to understand how to communicate in a way that is succinct, but gets your message across. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to the fact that we all have short attention spans, yeah. how can you create a story in as few words as possible to get the point across? Uh, and I first came across this story which taught me the importance of this uh, from a, I think it was a myth, I'm not sure if it's a real story, but it's based on a bet that Ernest Hemingway made. Mm -hmm. And the bet was, can he move an audience emotionally mm -hmm with a story that lasted just six words. Mm -hmm. And so he came to an audience that was put together by his friends, got out a piece of paper, and he read out the six words, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. <laughs> and the audience was moved emotionally because they got the story. And that teaches us that communication is not about how long something is, it's about your ability to communicate a story through as few words as possible and to create a visual in the audience's imagination so they can have an emotional connection to what you're sharing. Because emotion is nothing more than energy and motion. When you create that connection, that's how you inspire people. That's how you tap into people's emotions. I agree with you. What are the, so some of the podcasts uh, or probably video, uh, video content that you consume yourself? So for me, when it comes to podcasts, the great thing is, we are lucky and privileged in this world at the moment because there are so many podcasts that we can listen to um, and, and, and tap into knowledge from guests. The, the ones I listen to the most are probably Diary of a CEO by Stephen Bartlett, uh, the Chris Williamson podcast, Andrew Huberman, and High Performance by Jake Humphrey and Damien Hughes. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, I, I listen to other podcasts from time to time, uh, but by and large, I, I prefer to read. I, okay. I carry books more and I love to consume and highlight and then think about what action I'm going to mm -hmm. take uh, on the back of books I've read. No, I agree with you. I also like the hard books as well. I mean, mm. there, there's still some charm, <laughs> right? Out of all the technology that we can afford uh, to listen, to watch and everything. I do enjoy the, the video interviews yeah. anyway. Yeah, because yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, you can watch the people. One of the last things that I wanted to ask mm. you, since, uh, as I mentioned, we're talking mostly to a B2B audience. Sure. And we are talking a lot to our corporate audience mm. as well, apart from, uh, you know, business founders yeah. and let's say marketing agencies, PR agencies. I'd like to ask you, see, one of the most, uh, let's say, popular and uh, let's say exciting and 
feels like the most successful path is when a person transforms from a corporate mm. career into uh, his own business or founder career. And that's kind of, that has become very well spoken. We've sure. got a lot of lessons. But what if not everyone is created or not everyone's purpose is to become a founder eventually? Uh, they're great at building their corporate careers. Mm. Uh, they're, they're great at where they are, or maybe not great. Mm. Or I mean, we have different situations. Yeah. How do you recommend to sort of approach the the energy uh, situation, let's say, the energy sustainability mm. within a human when you're, let's say, you're staying where you are. Yeah. You don't want to transform into, like, Mm. dramatically you don't want to transform dramatically from one niche to another niche so you want to just develop in the niche where you are yeah. so what and, and that's have? completely fine because uh we all have different paths in life and if you enjoy what you do and you want to move up the career ladder in your company that you are in when you think about energy energy comes in four dimensions so we've got physical energy mental energy emotional energy and spiritual energy for a lot of us, we exclusively focus on physical energy. Just think back to the beginning of every new year. When you listen to resolutions that people make, it is either to focus more on work-life balance, to go on a diet regime, or to start getting fitter by going to, to a gym or fitness class. That's all about physical energy. We then got to think about mental energy, which is about your mindset, it's about creativity, it's about your ability to focus. Emotional energy is about your relationship with yourself and relationship with others around you. And then spiritual energy is about meaning and purpose. So when you evaluate yourself on those dimensions, you want to ask yourself, which of those areas do I feel lowest when it comes to my energy? And then address it. So if it's spiritual energy and it's about meaning and purpose, that means the way you're doing work or the work itself might not be suited for you in order to bring the best out of you. So if you enjoy the industry you work in and the company you're with, maybe a question to ask is how can I do what I do different so I can express more of my talent? And then when you approach it in a new way where you feel more comfortable with what you do and you feel more excited by the work you do, you're going to show up very differently. You're going to show up with more energy through enthusiasm, through the passion and through the commitment that you show. So it's just about understanding uh, where you are right now in terms of your energy and what you can do to change. Because if you can shift your environment to something that is far more energizing, people will notice and so will you. No, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so that's great. And the last, last one. Do mm. you think we always have to address our energy uh, situation? I don't know how to put, to, to put it in a different way. So like, for example, if you feel low, mm. could this mean that you're getting through a stage in your life where you feel some somewhat like a I don't know maybe a depression or something sure do, do some people require this time do they want to take that time to sort of get through that stage you, well you don't always need a wholesale change uh, it, it simply might be the case you need a break maybe you're not taking enough periods of rest and when you think about it society tells us that if you're not working if you're not doing you're not productive the reality is work and rest are partners of the same team You've got to have periods of your day and your week where, yes, you're going to be working hard, mm -hmm. but also periods where you can rest. If you only work with no rest, you are going to burn out. If you only rest without doing any work, nothing gets done. So you need to have a balance between work and rest. So it could be as simple as you need to just have more rest. Mm -hmm. You need to catch up with sleep. You need to move your body. You need to eat better. And then you have a stronger foundation of energy. Or it could be something more drastic. But... It, it is up to us to reflect uh, on what's required if we want to start each week, start each day with the energy required to showcase our potential. Amazing. I absolutely enjoy this conversation, <laughs> Simon. And thank you very much for sharing your philosophy. I think it's uh, an absolutely relevant topic for mm. the times and for the world that we're living in, uh, considering uh, how much energy everything around us is yeah. taking from us and actually puts us in a situation where we always have to run, yeah. right? We always have to move fast. I think talking about energy is so relevant. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for, yeah, for being the guest in this episode and uh, enjoy your time in Dubai. 
And uh, best of luck on uh, your events and speaking <laughs> gigs, let's say. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.